Sam tumbled down the goblin hole far into the dark, falling head over heel for a long way. He tried stopping himself, but the throng of goblins behind him kept him moving forward. He heard goblins giggling and snarling around him as they scurried towards their subterranean home. A couple of times one of them would yelp or cry out when Sam landed on one of them, but for the most part they just reacted as if he weren't there. He would have felt bad for landing on the ugly little creatures, but he had a feeling that they would pay him back for his offense while he was trapped underground. He expected the cave to be a dark, foul place filled with all kinds of horrors. He was surprised to find that he was only half right. The goblin's lair was in fact one of the most foul, rotten, and gruesome places he had ever seen. The floors were paved with the bones of dead animals that had been packed down into the earth from being trampled so frequently. Some of the bones had been picked clean, but others had rotten flesh still clinging to them. The walls were coated in a strange slime that smelled worse than any sewage that Sam had ever encountered, and to make matters worse, the slime gave off a sickly, pale green glow as it dripped down the walls. He thought it would be all over the floors, but the goblins had dug out ditches for the slime to run down. The walls also had mushrooms that seemed to glow different colors. Some were red, some were blue, and others were purple. It reminded him of a Jackson Pollock painting. The most gruesome part of the walls, though, was the fact that they were lined with torch sconces that had been made out of skulls, and to Sam's horror, some of them were human. The strange architecture didn't end there, though. The ceiling of the cavern was covered in what looked like a form of plaster, and it had been molded to look like a long spine. Sam yelled out in fright as the goblins carried him down the tunnel at a frightening pace. He didn't know how long until he would reach the bottom, or how far he had gone. It had been almost impossible to gauge distance underground. As he passed a bare skull sconce, he saw the goblins ahead of him rise upwards as if they were being carried along by a wave. His eyes grew big as he watched the sled rise and fall with the wave. He shouted after his presence, but the stream of goblins ignored him. He watched as the tunnel forked. He went one way and the presence went another. He twisted and turned to move after the presence, but the mob of goblins carried him away. There was no helping it though, and the goblins carried him along towards some terrible destination. He did his best to fight against the goblins, but it was no use. He was about to give up when all of a sudden he was free of the horde. He would have been happy, except for the fact that he was free of the ground too. He fell to the bottom of the pit and hit the ground with so much force that it knocked the air out of his lungs. He would have groaned in pain, but he could hardly breathe. He rolled onto his side and curled up into a ball, doing his best to regain his breath. After several moments, he got up to his feet. The goblins had dropped him down a dirty pit that was filled with slime and bones. He saw the skeleton of a man next to him who seemed to have suffered the same fate. He would have been shocked under most circumstances, but after everything that he had seen in the goblin tunnel, it didn't seem all that out of the ordinary. Great. Just great, Sam said. I mean, why not? I give up being with the most gorgeous woman alive to chase after some stupid presence, and I end up at the bottom of a cave, waiting to be eaten by goblins, sitting next to a dead guy. Why not? Well, I know I'm not the best company, but still, his dad said from behind. Ah! Good God, man, Sam shouted. Don't sneak up on me like that. I've been here this whole time, he said, as if it had been obvious. What the hell is wrong with you? Sam asked. Did you do this? He shrugged. I had to get you on your way somehow, he said. There's only so much I can do as a dead man. I can't do this, Sam said, walking away from his father. He began walking around the room looking for an exit. Do what? His father asked. This! Sam shouted angrily, gesturing at his father and his surroundings. I cannot have an argument with my dead father in a goblin hole. So if you don't mind, please leave me alone so I can find a way out. His father sighed and shook his head. Believe it or not, Sammy, I am here to show you the way back home, his father said. He placed one hand on the wall behind him and put on his hat with the other. He spoke to Sam as he disappeared into midair. Don't take too long. The goblins might be looking for you. Sam rolled his eyes at his father and began walking through the exit. It was just as gross and foul as the larger tunnel he had been in, but it was a much tighter fit and Sam had to resist the urge to gag. He walked down the tunnel for a long way before it began to open up again. When it did, he saw a large room, only room wasn't even close to the right word. It was as if the tunnel had opened up into a goblin city. It looked like it stretched on for miles. There were streets and houses and shops and high towers and even fountains flowing with vile waters. Each of the houses were carved out of rock and bone, with jagged edges to make everything from huts to palaces, all carved with elaborate walkways. The roofs had rough, wavy patterns, almost like each building had been covered by a webbed hand with fingers ending in sharp claws. When Sam saw the city, he felt his heart drop. 
He knew there was no way he would be able to find his presence. He doubted he would even be able to find his way out. The city was so big, and it was crawling with so many goblins that everything felt hopeless. He was about to give up in despair when something caught his eye. In the center of the city was a large, jagged building, suspended in air by various causeways. Unlike the rest of the hideous, brutal buildings that covered the cavern, the suspended building was almost beautiful. It was covered in glowing mushrooms and seemed to shine out like a star in the dark city. Sam watched as goblins carried other treasures into the star building. He saw watches, bracelets, forks, knives, spoons, ornaments, headlights, and even more. Everything even remotely shiny was being carried into the building by the hideous green creatures. Before he knew it, he was on his feet, picking his way towards the star building across narrow walkways and slanted roofs. Soon, he was only about 50 feet away. The goblins took notice of him and began running towards him, but there were too few of them to stop him. He kicked and threw them out of his way and ran towards the entrance. It was barely big enough for him to get inside. He managed to barely squeeze his way through the gap just as he heard the boom of a loud drum sound out in the darkness. After the drum, there was a loud, echoing howl of thousands of goblins screaming and cackling in the darkness. Sam panicked and closed the door to the star building, barring it behind him. Goblins began banging on the door, but it held, and Sam let out a sigh of relief. He looked around the room and gasped. It was filled with all sorts of trinkets and treasures. Some of them were junk. There were headlights from a car, plastic toys, old tin cans, keychains, and other strange but useless items. They weren't the only treasures in the room, though. There were rings and bracelets, watches and necklaces, brooches, pins, coins, jewels, pearls, and more. He was willing to bet there was millions of dollars worth of valuables, and Sam was almost tempted to forget about the presents and just stuff his pockets with treasures. He saw his sled in the distance, though, and he began moving towards it. He was stepping over a broken bicycle when his father appeared, sitting on top of a pile of treasure next to him. Talk about a needle in a haystack, his dad said. Sam nearly fell over out of fright. Can you please not do that? Sam asked angrily. At least whistle or something. His father just slid nonchalantly down the pile of treasures and began walking around the room. He stooped down and picked up a gem to examine it. I really doubt I'm the biggest of your problems, he said, tossing Ruby over his shoulder. How exactly do you plan on getting out of here? I don't know. I haven't gotten that far, Sam said angrily, swearing as he tripped over a chandelier. Why the hell are you here? It's not like you're helping. His dad shook his head. I told you why I'm here. I'm here because you summoned me, he said. The question is, why are you here? I don't know, Sam said. Maybe it's because the ghost of my father decided to cause my car to crash, and then sent me on a wild goose chase across frozen wildernesses and underground lairs. His father shook his head as he looked at the treasures around the room. That's not what I meant, Sammy, he said, picking up more jewelry. I mean, why are you in Minnesota, visiting your sister? Because it's Christmas, Sam said, climbing over another pile of junk. It's been years since you've visited her, his father said. I'm all for family growing closer over the holidays, but I don't think Christmas is what drew you back. Sam felt his temper rising. Maybe I just felt like it was a good time to catch up. Did you think of that? He said angrily. Besides, what right do you have to question me? You left us! Oh, is that right? I left you? His father asked. He bent down and picked up his wedding ring and shouted excitedly. Aha! Yes, Sam said, exploding at his father. You left me. You were supposed to be there all those Christmases and more, and you left. His father put the ring back on and sighed. Well, Sammy, death was a bit out of my control, but in the spirit of fairness, I've missed fewer Christmases than you have, he said. If I remember correctly, you left first. I'm dead. What's your excuse? The words stung like he had been slapped in the face. He opened his mouth to respond, but his father was gone. He turned away angrily, but a single tear streamed down from his eye. He did his best to ignore his father and focus on the presents, but his father's words echoed in his ears. He finally managed to climb to the top of the pile with the presents. He seized the sled in one hand and the presents in the other. He got down from the pile and opened the sack of presents to check and see if they were all there. He let out a sigh of relief when he saw each present tucked away safely inside the sack. As he looked at the gifts, he felt his heart ache and he let out a long sigh. I'm back because you left, Sam said. You made me come back, and I don't know if I can forgive you for it. He would have stayed there for a while, but he heard a loud boom as the goblins beat against the door. In a panic, he snatched up the sled and the presents again and ran towards another door. He pressed his ear to it and heard nothing. He held his breath as he threw it open. To his relief, there was no one on the other side. He stepped out and saw that it was a walkway that led away from the treasure trove. 
There were goblins below him, and he saw big ones that were even taller than him, running slowly, lumbering towards the treasury. As he ran, the goblins took notice of him and started running towards him. He let out a startled yelp and ran even faster, doing his best to keep his balance. The goblins began throwing things at him as he ran, but he didn't slow down. He dodged rocks, darts, spears, and arrows as he ran, and he began to hope that he would make it out safely. But the goblins began climbing the walls. He shouted out in alarm and looked around desperately for an exit. He cast his eyes about frantically, but didn't see anything. Finally, his eyes landed on a narrow passage that seemed to lead upwards. He began running towards it, narrowly missing the projectiles hurled at him. By the time he made it to the exit, the goblins had almost caught up with him. He began running as fast as he could, but the passage was too narrow for him to move quickly, and it began to spiral tightly. He did his best to stay ahead of the creatures, and he ran and ran and ran until the goblins were biting at his heels. Finally, when he felt like he was about to be overcome by the goblins, he saw a dim beam of light ahead of him. He climbed the passage with renewed strength and burst out into the fresh night air. The moon shone brightly above him, casting a silvery glow on the snowy pines around him. It felt good to breathe the crisp, clean winter air. But he didn't have time to savor it. The goblins began flooding out of the hole in the ground. He wasted no time and he ran towards the edge of the woods. The tree stopped at a steep drop and opened up into a wide clearing. He didn't hesitate. He got on the sled and began sliding down the hill with goblins close behind. They were incredibly fast, and he almost thought that they would catch him even with the sled. He was running out of hill, too, and then they would catch him. He grew afraid and closed his eyes, but just when he thought he was as good as gone, he heard a thundering sound behind him. He turned to see a reindeer running towards him and the goblins at full gallop. They caught up with him right as the ground flattened out. The goblins scattered to avoid the deer, and the ones who were too slow were trampled on foot. The reindeer ran around Sam, and to his amazement, they took off into the air as they passed him. The sled slowed to a stop, and Sam stood and watched in wonder as the reindeer flew into the air. One of the reindeer passed him, carrying his father on his back. His dad gave him a wink and rode the reindeer into the night sky. Sam looked around desperately and grabbed the sled and the sack of presents in one arm and reached out for the antlers with another. The deer bucked violently and swung him up into the air. He landed on its back and took off into the sky. He panicked for a moment, afraid he might lose his presents or the sled. But he managed to keep a firm grip on both, and he kept an even firmer grip on the reindeer's antlers. He shivered as he flew through the air on the animal, partially from the cold, but partially from the excitement. His deer began to fly closer to his father, and soon Sam and his father were riding next to each other. Sam was still angry with his father, but he felt too ashamed to say anything about it. Instead, he decided to focus on something more practical. I don't suppose there's something you can do about the cold, he said. His father shrugged. Not really, he said. You'll live. Still, I'd give my right arm for a sip of hot chocolate. Sam groaned at the answer, but he did his best to deal with the cold. Did you ride reindeer too? Sam asked. I mean, you danced with the fairy lady, and you knew about the wolves and the goblins, so you must have, right? I've ridden them, he said. It was about as cold then as it is now, too. What else did you do on your adventures? Sam asked. Oh, tons, his father said. I saw trolls, elves, goblins, dragons, candy forests, and more. How did you manage to see all that? Sam asked. How is it no one else has seen them? Other people have seen them, he said. Most of them are children, but tons of people have seen stuff like that. The world is filled with magic and wonder for those who have the eyes to see it. Have I ever seen anything like this? Sam asked. Oh, you saw plenty of exciting creatures and amazing wonders when you were younger. Well, how come I don't remember it now? Sam asked. If the world is so full of magic, why don't I have any memories of it? The world is full of wonders, his father said. The world is full of wonders, his father said. The only reason you've forgotten that is because you're the only part of the world where the wonder is gone. Sam sat in silence for a long moment. Can I ever get it back? he asked. You can always regain the part of you that sees the magic in the world, his dad said. I thought I had lost it until you were born. You brought it back into my life again. After that they were silent, and they watched as the woods and lakes passed by underneath them. Sam looked around and saw several amazing things beneath him. He saw the glowing wolves and the fairy dance. He saw snowmen walking around and trees of silver and gold. He even saw a palace beyond the moon, shining out in the distance. The cold began to make him shiver, but he hardly even felt it. He just looked down in awe at the things below him. Before long, the reindeer landed on the ground and he got off its back. They snorted and began walking around while Sam stretched his legs. He took a long time to loosen up his tight muscles before he noticed the reindeer were all slowly moving in one direction. They were busy eating something on the ground. Sam looked at them curiously and followed them to see what they were eating. 
He looked down and picked up a purple ball. It was kind of tacky and sticky, and it smelled sweet. What's this? he asked, turning to his father, who was busy stroking reindeer's snout. Are you serious? his dad asked. Did I raise that big of an idiot? Come on, Dad, Sam said in exasperation. I don't need your sarcasm. Just tell me what it is. He shook his head and kept petting the reindeer. It's a sugar plum. Seriously? Sam asked, giving him a strange look. His father rolled his eyes. No, it's a candy cane. Sam rolled his eyes too, and he took a bite of the fruit. Sam rolled his eyes, and he took a bite of the fruit. It wasn't bad, and he knew why the reindeer liked it so much. Where did they come from? He asked. His father didn't look up from the reindeer. Follow it and find out. As if on cue, the reindeer's heads perked up as a clear, crisp bell rang out. They ran towards it and left Sam and his father alone. Sam picked up his presents on the sled and followed the reindeer. So I've been thinking about what you said, Sam said to his dad. He didn't look at his father's face. He just kept walking after the reindeer. I guess there is a reason I'm back here, and it's not just because I miss my sister. His father didn't say anything. He just kept walking along in silence. Sam continued. I couldn't wait to be gone from here. I didn't want anything to do with you or with my home, and I took the first chance to leave that I could. When you died, it grew worse. It wasn't just that you left us. You left a hole, too. It felt like I was supposed to fill that void you left. It felt like your last act was to pull me back to the place that I hated so much. He paused to see if his father would say anything, but he just kept on in silence. I realize now that I was completely right. You were calling me back. And I should have been here sooner, even though I kind of hate it. I mean, you were stolen from us. But I robbed Mom and the rest of the family of myself. And they didn't have either of us in their lives because of me. I guess I just couldn't take it anymore. It's time to be back, you know? Dad? He turned to his father, but he was alone. He let out a sigh and kept following the reindeer tracks. He could hear bells and singing in the distance, and before long he came across a clearing. There were lights shining through the trees, and he stepped into the open to see a giant Christmas tree, decorated with lights and tinsel and ornaments, with a large angel on the top smiling down on the forest below. Around the tree were elves, singing and dancing merrily in circles around the base. There were elves singing, or passing out food and drink, or dancing, or playing instruments, or performing magic tricks. One of them drew a horse in the air with his finger, and it came to life and galloped around. Another took off his hat, and showing that it was empty, tossed it up into the air. Sweet treats began raining out of the hat as it fell. Sam laughed and grabbed some of the falling food. It was the sweetest he had ever tasted. Reindeer began wandering through the partygoers, and elves began playing on their legs and antlers, and others began to laugh. Sam laughed with them and joined in the merriment. He grabbed a mug of hot chocolate and took a sip. It was piping hot, but it was the most delicious hot chocolate he had ever tasted. It didn't completely warm him up, but it did make him feel much less cold, and he was content to forget his troubles for a moment. He saw his father leaning against a tree and taking a sip of hot chocolate. It's been a while since I've had a drink this good, he said. Sam smiled softly and shook his head. It definitely hits the spot, he said. His dad grinned. You're smiling, he said. I thought it would never happen. Sam realized that his dad was right. I suppose I am, he said. It's been a long time since I've seen that particular smile, his dad said. Your mom used to say you only smiled like that for me. Sam took another sip. He shrugged. I guess you bring out that part of me, he said. His dad nodded sadly. It's been too long since anyone's seen that part of you, he said. That's the part I miss the most, you know, Sam said. It's not that I miss you exactly. I mean, I do, but I miss the part of everyone else that only ever came out around you. I feel like everyone keeps looking for you and me. They want me to be like you for them, and I just can't do that. His father put his hand on Sam's shoulder. You will never be able to do that. That part of them is gone for good, he said sadly. But there's a part of them that no one gets to see when you are gone. They don't want to see the part of me that lives in them half as bad as they want to see the part of you that's been gone for too long. Well, I guess I'm five years late to the party, Sam said, taking another drink. Let's just make sure you get there before it ends, he said. He took off his hat and handed it to his son. Take this. Who knows? Maybe you can re-gift it. His father began to walk away, and Sam reached out to him. Wait! Where are you going? he demanded. Oh, I think I've done enough here, he said. I have to get back. Back? Sam said frantically. You just got here. Don't leave yet. What if I need you again? His father stopped and turned to face him with a soft smile. Let go of me, Sammy, and cling to your mother and sister even harder. 
Sam called after his father again, but he walked away and disappeared in front of his eyes. He would have watched the spot where his father had been, and stared off into the darkness, waiting for him to come back. But the woods shook with a loud roar. The elves stopped partying, and the reindeer all looked in the direction of the sound. Slowly, a giant snowy monster with large horns and teeth and sharp claws came lumbering into the clearing. The elves screamed and scattered, and the reindeer ran away. Sam was caught on the ground and stood in shock and watched as the monster chased after the elves and reindeer. He had long, white fur, and he breathed ice. He looked like he would eat anything in his path. The elves must have gotten the same impression. They had all hid from the monster, and Sam realized that he was alone with it. He grabbed his presents and his sleigh, and he ran. The monster followed him into the woods, and he looked over his shoulder in horror to see a blast of freezing air hurling towards him. He turned to face forwards again and ran. He felt like his legs might give out, but he refused to let himself stop running. The monster was still fast, though, and it towered over him, gaining ground quickly. Soon, he was close enough to swing at Sam. He missed Sam by inches and slashed open the sack of presents, causing a couple of them to fall out. Sam screamed and jumped to the side to avoid being killed. He rolled over and looked into the monster's face as it raised a hand to kill him. He held out his arms protectively and begged the monster not to kill him. Somehow it worked. The monster didn't kill him. Instead, it reached down and delicately picked up the hat his father had given him. It placed it on one of its big horns and began singing to itself. The monster's singing sounded like a deep, lowing, humming sound, and he seemed happy with the hat. Sam let out a nervous laugh, and the monster laughed too. He began to dance, and Sam danced with him. After a long moment, Sam stopped dancing and gathered up his presents again. As he put the last one in his sack and placed it on the sled, he felt himself being lifted into the air. He yelped in surprise and saw the snow monster place him on his shoulders and carry the gifts in the other hand. Sam didn't know where the monster was taking him, but he didn't really care anymore. The monster handed him the sled and the presents, and Sam held them in his lap awkwardly. He looked at one of the presents in the sack. The present had been torn open, revealing the contents. He realized it was the gift he got for his sister. It was a music box. It had been the first gift his dad had gotten his mom. She had gotten it out every year to play around Christmas, right as his father would sit down to tell stories. Somehow, it had ended up with him and he had kept it for years. He wound it and opened it to reveal a ballerina dancing with a nutcracker. There was a mirror behind them, and in the mirror he could see himself. As the music played, the monster hummed along with it. Sam ignored the monster. He just stared at the mirror. He saw himself, but it wasn't exactly himself. Something about him looked different. It was as if he could see his father in his own face. He smiled and felt a single tear roll down his face. After a while, the monster slowed to a stop. Sam realized it was almost daytime, and he suddenly knew where he was. He was near his sister's house. He gave the monster a pat on the head and slid off his shoulder. The monster turned to leave, and Sam waved after him before running towards his sister's house. She was maybe a mile away, and he knew she and her husband and children would be waiting for him. Finally, he saw it. He felt a second wind, and he ran even faster. He got to the door and slowed to a stop, taking a deep breath and straightening his coat. He looked at the presents in the sled. He swallowed a lump that had formed in his throat and rang the doorbell. He smiled nervously as his brother-in-law opened the door. Sam, he said, sounding surprised. I didn't think you'd be here. I thought you'd be back in New York. I wanted to make my visitors a surprise, he said. I hope that's not a problem. No, no, not at all, Arthur said. Denise will be so excited to see you. Come on in. Thank you, Sam said. It's good to be here. Well, we're glad to have you, Arthur said. He looked down at the music box. What's that? Oh, Sam said, looking down at it. It's an old family heirloom. My mom would let it play while my dad would tell stories. I figured Denise might like it. I think she would love it. I'll go get her now, he said. He moved to go get his wife before turning back to Sam. He shook his finger as he spoke, as if he had gotten an amazing idea. Hey! We should wind it up for the kids. You can sit and tell them some stories. Sam smiled softly. That's a wonderful idea, he said. I think I have a story I can tell.